testing. Okay, the fifth lecture today is on limits. So this is a part one of the limit lecture. And what I want to do to cover in the limits today is the earliest notions of infinity, viewing limits as one way to handle infinite process. So we will delve back into the early notions of infinity and the continuum and discrete nature of time and space, Zeno's paradox. And then we'll do a little, again, historical digression on how people tried to make limits more precise. Now, before I get in too involved in that, I wanted to point out that there is a homework 2A, as I promised. What this is, is just to take the Java applet and just turn step by step what the applet is doing into a sequence of equations which demonstrate uh, basically a more rigorous proof of the Pythagorean theorem. So uh, you can click on that. You'll remember how they basically you're sliding and translating and shearing like a uh, triangle. Also, let's see, I've added some links uh, to the unsolved problems. I've put a thing above that of merely hard problems, but not necessarily unsolved problems. Now, these are problems. Hard problems are problems which can be solved by brute force, but really there's no elegant solution. So for example, determine whether a given number is prime. Well, if it's even, you're done. But if it's odd, is the number prime or not? Well, you can obviously test all the factors up to the square root. That's a brute force. But it involves um, basically an amount of work that is not polynomial in time. And if you have a number which is known to be compo composite, composite, factor it into product of primes, because it's prime number of factorization. That, again, can be done by brute force, but it involves essentially exponential work. There are no fast, elegant uh, prime factorization algorithms. There are some speed ups, but these are problems which are known to be not polynomial um, algorithms. So they're called NP, non-polynomial. So the difficulty of these two problems is actually forms the basis of modern encryption algorithms. So the, you've all heard of the RSA encryption algorithm. If you uh, want to learn about that, you should just click on the link. This actually goes through the RSA encryption algorithm. And I've had undergraduate students who, who, who have programmed RSA encryption algorithms in Maple. In fact, there's a cute little Perl script in the bottom. If you ever want to know how to write obscure code, here it is. Here is a two-line Perl program that will do RSA encryption. So, and it's, it's not readable. I mean, it's, I couldn't even begin to unpack it. But apparently, it does do RSA encryption. So. Now there's an example of RSA encryption, but the meat of it is the fact that you have to pick prime numbers, and if you pick a if you pick a number, you might know it's prime factorization, but someone else might not. And the difficulty is, is if if one of the prime factors is your key, uh, then you know it's prime factorization very easily, but another person would have to factor it into primes, and that's known to be a very difficult problem. In fact, there's a statement down here that just factoring an arbitrary 100-digit prime, um, if there's T and Q are 124 bits long, so that's roughly 100 digits, then the sun will burn out before the most powerful computers presently in existence can factor your problem modulus into T and Q uh, prime. So it, you pick a prime number, or you pick a key with enough digits in it, and it's pretty well uh, un unbreakable. So this is the basis of the RSA encryption algorithm. And the mathematicians at MIT who developed this actually formed their own company, and they have the patent on the RSA encryption algorithm. There's also a nice article that appeared in the Atlantic Monthly if you want to read a little bit further about encryption, because we'll talk about that as one of the problems in the course later on. Uh, this appeared as a companion web article to an Atlantic Monthly Journal article in 
2002. So this talks about the essence of public private key encryption, just sort of in words. There's no algorithms in here. So you can look through that. It's a nice print it out and kind of work through that. Another problem, which is known to not be unsolvable, but just merely very hard, is graph coloring. Uh, and not just putting a color at the edges or vertices of a graph, but to do it with a minimum number of colors so no two adjacent vertices have the same color. And that's known to be an NP complete non-polynomial uh, algorithm. And if you want to learn a little bit more about NP completeness and references and discussions, this one actually has a lot of mathematical problems that are known to be NP in complexity. Uh, so if you go down in here, there's some linear programming problems, primality tests. Uh, graph isomorphisms, independent edges, factoring, finding independent nodes on a graph, etc. So you can go ahead and just take a look at those. And those are what I call hard problems. Brute force algorithms do exist, but the brute force algorithms are known to be exponentially uh, complex in the sense that they, as the problem scales in N, like, for example, you know that solving for the inverse of a matrix takes roughly order n cubed over 3, where n is the dimension of the matrix. So that's a polynomial uh, algorithm, because it's polynomial in the, in the size of the problem. But calculating a determinant, say, by expanding in cofactors as smaller determinants, basically takes n factorial, and n factorial is not polynomial. So we have a difference between merely very hard problems and unsolved problems. And there are, actually I should probably put unsolvable, like trisecting the angle is an unsolvable problem. It's not just hard, it's not just unsolved, it's unsolvable. Okay. So let me go back to the lecture here. Uh, just continue looking through the notes and the news and that will tell you sort of what, where we're going. Uh, today, I wanted to discuss the idea and the notion of a limit. Let me just bump this up a little bit. Now, as we know, the, the idea of a limit goes way, way back to the Greeks and maybe even earlier than that. And it was their first way of coming to grips with the concept of an infinite process. So, we remember that Zeno's paradox had to do with the problem of an arrow. And, they, and basically it said if, you, if, if time and space were discrete, then the only way an arrow could move through time is essentially jumping through discrete points in time, which was paradoxical. And so really what they were looking at is this infinite paradox of the Achilles and the tortoise, right? You know, Achilles, how could you go from point A to point B, because first you'd have to go half the distance, and half, and half, and half. And so they understood what it meant to consider an infinite sequence, an infinite process, but they had no tools to say, well, it just sums up to one, or it sums up to two. Okay, so they didn't have any of the analytical tools that we have currently. So the first attempt to understand uh, the infinite process uh, dates back, in a mathematical sense, to a so-called method of exhaustion. Now, the method of exhaustion is a method that Archimedes used to calculate the area of a parabola, the quadrature of a parabola. He actually wrote an article, and I, I have a, that link in a second. I'll go through it. So the idea is that using the underlying limits, which are, of course, critical for the calculus, develops all the way back to the Greek mathematicians in its first stages. And as we know, prior to the idea of an irrational number, the Greeks had this idea of integers and ratios of integers, so they had the field of rational numbers, and they filled it in by using square roots. But of course, that didn't get all of the numbers, right? Didn't give you e or pi or cube roots. So they knew there were defects in their system, but they still had the process. So let's go beyond this, you know, paradox. And then Archimedes, 
applied, in Eudoxus actually uh, applied the exhaustion here because it says that if you're calculating the area, like imagine embedded polygons in a circle, you gradually increase the number of polygons until you fill out the area. And so that's basically an integration type of argument. So this computing areas by sequential approximation by this method of exhaustion was used by Archimedes to actually calculate the area underneath a parabola with any chord that intersected the parabola. So this is what he basically computed, calculated the area of an internal triangle. So, for example, let's uh, just show you what this means in terms of a picture. If you have a, let's just do a, a rectangle here and a vertical one. And suppose you draw a parabola, of course not a very good parabola, pretend it was symmetric, <laughs> then the idea is you would be able to calculate the area of a interior, call that A, and what this would give you is this this is the area of the interior. The area of the parabola was four-thirds the area of the inscribed triangle. So he actually wrote it as a sequence of sequential areas. So he first approximated it as A, then he added A over 4 by putting in a, an approximation in here, and then A over 16, etc., and then basically they sum the series to be four-thirds over A. Now, there's a link to this, actually the original paper, if you will, of Archimedes, the quadrature of the parabola. Now bear in mind that this is, you know, 24, 2200 years ago. So what Archimedes did was he wrote a letter to this fellow, the Theseus, and he describes the problem of calculating areas of circles and parabolas. And so he comes down here, and I'll, let's go down to the construction. So he has a very Euclidean, he has a, a proposition one, proposition two, et cetera. And eventually we'll come into the result. Somewhere down there is an actual result. Now, okay, there's a four-thirds in there. So you can see anyway that there's a, let's find it here. Anyhow, he applies the sequential idea of areas in here and then gradually just keeps on computing areas inscribed and then he knows that the areas of the inscribed polygon because implicitly because of complexity cannot exceed the area of the parabola. He has a sequence of areas which approach the area of the parabola from below, and he actually says that the area of the parabola is four-thirds the area of this inscribed triangle. Now, you can easily see that if, uh, if you just do the integral, right, is suppose you have, uh, suppose this is the parabola f equals one minus x squared, and this goes from minus one, zero, to one, zero, and zero, one, then the area of this triangle is equal to what? It's one half the base, which is two times the height, which is one, so the area of the triangle is equal to one, but the area of the parabola is the area between minus one and one of one minus x squared, so that's x minus x cubed over three between minus one and one, and so at the upper limit, it's one minus a third, which is, well, it's symmetric, so it's twice x minus x cubed over three between zero and one. So it's one minus a third is two thirds, so this is four thirds, which is four thirds the area of the triangle. <coughs> 
So you can actually compute that in a specific case, but he proved, without using integrals obviously, that the area of that parabola was four-thirds the area of the inscribed. And he did the same for actually solids, so he calculated volumes of cones. So I mean, it was, it was, he was doing integral calculus, basically, at 200 BC. So that's pretty impressive. So the Greeks... No, the Greeks did not have what we would call analysis in the sense of epsilons and deltas and um, distance metrics and things like that. All they, all they had was uh, geometrical areas and they had certain special cases and they, they obviously knew how to sum an infinite series like one plus a half plus a fourth, et cetera. Or, you know, so they had some ideas of these uh, well, geometric why series. They didn't um, probably because their algebraic capabilities, the reason why the Greeks didn't develop the analysis part, was that they were so geometrical that the algebraic part didn't really develop. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't really have, I mean, it wasn't until the Arabs with a full system of algebra, you know, in the Middle Ages that we were really able to do things symbolically. So, I mean, they had distances, they could construct things, they had rational numbers, they knew, they didn't have pi, but they knew sort of what it was as the area of the unit circle and things like that. Uh, but they did not have the symbolic manipulation algebraic techniques that would lead them into questions of like making... And two, they had the ideas of, of limits, but not the machinery that we have today. Uh, and which leads us right nicely into the next uh, topic, which is how does one make these concepts more precise? It's one thing to offer up a sequential geometric construction, uh, which to the Greeks would be perfectly rigorous, but to us is somewhat not satisfactory because, okay, now you've got the sequence for parabola, now do it for cubic, or do it for a fifth of the polynomial. They couldn't do it, right? Or it's x to the two-thirds power. So what, what we needed was a more precise definition of an infinite process, specifically a limit. Now, if you click on this link, this is on the concept of a limit, you can see how the idea of a limit gradually evolved uh, up to the 1600s. Essentially, it was the Greek concept of geometry, and right around Newton's time, um, they started to develop being this idea of infinitesimals and the ideas of limits and ratios and uh, the differential calculus relied critically on the idea of a limit. So Leibniz, his concept of a limit was that if you have a continuous transition that is supposed to terminate in a certain limit, then it's possible to form a general reasoning or a general argument that covers also the final limit. So, in other words, you could talk about a sequence of problems and in the limit apply the same argument to, to the limit. So, it's not really a mathematical statement. Newton was uh, one of the first to actually talk about a numerical quantity, like a ratio. So, he had this idea of in, infinitum getting smaller and smaller, the ratios of two numbers, sort of uh, both numerator and denominator getting smaller, and but still approaching a fixed ratio. Then McLaurin a little bit later, D'Alembert, Lacroix, and then finally Cauchy. Cauchy really kind of put uh, this on the map, although Weierstrass had more or less the epsilon delta concept that we have today. So it was a gradual making um, the idea of a limit more precise. Now, it, it's, it's interesting to know that there was sort of a spur. I mean, Newton and the people of his time really did believe in the idea of an infinitesimal, what they called a flexion. Now, what is an infinitesimal? An infinitesimal is a positive quantity which is smaller than any rational number. Okay, it's really epsilon as epsilon goes to zero, but not equal to zero, right? What is that number? Well, they had this idea that it was actually an object, like a little atomic quantity that was smaller than any positive rational number, but not zero. Uh, 
Now, it turns out, I mean, kind of, well, Kofi probably was the death knell to that because he put in the rigorous epsilon delta uh, analysis that we have today. So we kind of threw out the concept of an infinitesimal. But the idea returned in something called non-standard analysis. So here I have a link. There's a book that you can actually download or read. It's a rigorous development of the calculus based on the assumption that there are infinitesimals. Okay? This took like almost 140 years from when they developed integral and differential calculus before they developed that exponential calculus. Uh, well, Vyastas, uh, let's see. Uh, Vyastas, I believe. So one can actually teach and develop calculus rigorously using infinitesimals. And this idea of using infinitesimals is something which we call now non-standard analysis. So it's, and that wasn't developed until 1960. Okay. So this is one of these examples of an axiomatic system where you, you postulate the existence of an infinitesimal. You then generate an arithmetic that tells how infinitesimals and real numbers are related in terms of inequalities. And you have to know things like how to multiply an infinitesimal by a real number, what the product of two infinitesimals is, and things like that. So I mean, it's, in a sense, it's no more uh, strange than the idea of a distribution to somebody who believes only in continuous functions. But it's just sort of a split in the road that came much later. So you can download this book. And, and they go pretty far. It's probably up to. I mean, our four semesters at Calculus, so up to 308. So, so in, uh, for chapter one, you know, these are PDF files. And you probably don't want to print out the whole thing. You can if you wish to print out the whole thing. But just to develop what are called the hyperreal numbers is an interesting exercise. So this is a nice PDF document. The first chapter is 42 pages. So it's a kind of a long manuscript. But it tells you basically how to construct them. And what you have to do is define an arithmetic of infinitesimals. And there's some axioms here. They've got the, um, now non-standard analysis is still even currently fairly exotic. And I doubt whether you have many mathematicians nowadays who have really even studied it in a course. So we've got the piano axioms and plus the construction of the rationals and closure of the rationals to real. And then down, eventually it gets into what a hyperreal number is, which involves uh, the flexion or infinitesimal. OK, so we won't go through this. It's kind of technical and complex. But it just goes to show you that oftentimes in mathematics, you can have a good idea that's just before its time. So the idea of a fluxion or infinitesimal didn't go anywhere. And then Koshy and Weierstrass essentially gave us the current approach to calculus, epsilon delta proofs, and only you know, 100, 200 years later, did we get back to investigating was there any uh, rationale in their original system? And it turns out there is. And in fact, there are whole websites devoted to non-standard analysis. OK, I mean, give it NSA. <laughs> Not to be confused with the government agency of the same name. So Abraham Robinson developed non-standard analysis in the 1960s and has been uh, applied to areas like probability and economics and mathematical physics. So key is this idea of the hyperreal line. And this gives more or less a rigorous development. OK. So what is an infinitesimal? An infinitesimal number is just something which is not 0, but nevertheless smaller than any, it's a positive quantity smaller than any other positive rational number. Now, there's also a link to uh, what I would call great moments of 
to calculus. Go over here. So we have squaring methods from ancient times to the 17th century, you know, using uh, rectangles for approximate areas. Um, the development of the problem of the tangents, uh, Newton and Leibniz, how calculus spread. I mean, since this is an Italian site, it says calculus in Italy, the foundations of calculus, then Viasoft's treaties, theory of real numbers, integration, and measure. So then there's even an uh, exhibition of this story. It's in Italian, if you're telling this good. So what we see here is a gradual development or an approach to one of the fundamental problems of mathematics, namely how to make sense of an infinite sequence or an infinite sequence of areas or an infinite process. What You can't actually obtain the limit in the sense that actually proceeding step by step and, and finally going, doing an infinite number of steps. So the question is how to get there indirectly. And of course, one of the ways we do it nowadays is with the idea of epsilons and deltas, and that really requires that you uh, have the concept of a distance. Because one of the processes that they would recognize is if you have a sequence of numbers, and you can take these sets of numbers and bound them by, suppose you have a set of numbers that's on this interval, then you have a set of numbers that's on this interval, and then a set of numbers that's on this interval, etc. But it's pretty clear eventually that you can approach some kind of limit. But what you really have to show is that you are in an interval where the distance of the interval is going to zero. And so the idea of a length of an interval, which basically is another way of saying distance, and that's critical. You have to have the idea of a metric. Because the class is the limit as epsilon goes to zero of, um, you know, if we even write down like we understand now, the limit of uh, h as h goes to zero for the quotient is defined. So what you have to do is actually make sense of this. Now this is what we have is in modern notation. But you can understand the idea of a limit, limit as x approaches a of some function f of x. You can, you can say what does that mean? Limit as x goes to some number of f of x. You can make sense of that as we understand now in terms of epsilons and deltas, but you could also understand it intuitively as a geometrical sequence, just getting closer and closer to a number L as X gets close to C. We'll talk a little bit more about examples of limits in the next lecture, and we'll actually pose some problems of calculating some geometrical and limits, some limits of areas, uh, limits of sequences, limits of functions, function values, etc. So we'll come up with just sort of looking at a number of practical problems and how the ideas of a limit allow you to compute indirectly function values and discontinuities and limits of discontinuities. Now, it should be clear just from your own understanding of how you yourself learn calculus that limits are far from being obvious uh, intellectually. Most students, I mean, this is one of those big divisions in mathematics. It really divides before calculus to after calculus. It's the same way as algebra kind of divides geometry from later on. I mean, many people can develop sort of an idea of, of geometry and lines and circles and things, but when you start pushing around symbols and quadratic formulas, it's just it's, an, it's a layer of abstraction that's just not intuitive. And some people just don't get the hang of algebraic symbols. Some people just don't get the hang of limits because it is a intellectual leap. I mean, limits were not obvious 
it took from the Greeks 200, 400 BC all the way up to the 1600s before the idea of limits were made precise. They, they talked about limits, they had ideas about limits, they performed computations that involved limits, but they were not able to write it down in a way that allowed them to manipulate them or apply them to functions and graphs, not until the uh, time of Leibniz and, and Newton. So there's actually, I found some papers here. There's, this one is how to teach limits, and this is something that appeared on a, a website at Stanford, and it goes through just some of the ideas uh, intuitively what you have when you try to teach limits to an audience that is not necessarily uh, have the abstract symbolism required to really understand the current definitions of limits. There's my ruler here. So uh, it, again, this is more or less an internal document for some of the people at Stanford. So, uh, but it's, it's, it has some reasonable ideas here. Okay. Now this is the okay. Well this is I have not tweaked this before. <laughs> I, I can't censor anything. It's a freedom of expression here. Um, but again, we know that there's rigorous analysis, rigorous thinking, critical thinking, logical reasoning, uh, being able to string together sequences of st steps that logically follow from the pre preceding step. These are not what I would call, you're not born knowing how to do this. And some people find it very easy. Uh, probably if you're in this room, it's because you find it easier than other people uh, to do uh, rigorous uh, mathematical symbolism. But it's definitely one of those, what I would call intellectual hurdles or intellectual steps. It's kind of a quantum leap. You have to go from the concept of geometry to algebra, algebra to the idea of limit, then you go from limits to more abstract things that you can't visualize, and, and just pushing around abstract symbols and you know, groups of algebra and things like this, and even getting more and more abstract where it's not even possible to visualize. Each of these steps involves really, you, you've got to master a language which is not, not intuitive. There's one more link that I found at the back. Uh, and that is, that nowadays, we have a, a tool that did not exist in uh, Toshi or Weierstrass or Leibniz or Newton's time. Namely, we have computer algebra systems which allow you to manipulate symbols and, by, and push around axioms and possibilities and even proof theorems. Uh, we know the names of some of these. We use Maple, MATLAB. Drive, Mathematica, um, McLaurin, there's a bunch of, of, of them out there. And there's a nice little article here on how to teach limits using a computer algebra system. Now the advantage of a computer algebra system is that you're not locked into a specific example. You can draw a little maple program, let's say, that does a sequence of points converging to a limit. And you can illustrate at least the visualization of a limit using a computer algebra system. If not, we're just we're doing the limits itself. So here's an example of, I guess this is probably, uh, this is Matthew, so it looks like it's coming off of a Mac. It looks sort of Macintoshian in its format. And there's a nice little dialogue, you know, what does this mean? I have no idea what a limit is. Limit means limit <laughs> point. So this is, if you didn't have any mathematics, how would you convince somebody what the limit was of the sequence, or what the, or that that you could sum a series one plus a plus a squared plus a cubed plus a to the n going to infinity is one over one minus a. I mean. Try doing that in words without mathematical notation, and you'll, you'll appreciate very quickly the kinds of power that mathematical notation has. 
Okay. So we use limits in mathematics all the time. And this, this particular lecture is just to essentially develop the limit as a corollary to the early Greek methods of exhaustion and some of the infinite sequences and some ability relations that they had. And again, it's really amazing that Archimedes essentially was doing integral calculus back in 200 plus BC. But it was not until Newton in the 1670s, 1680s that actually developed the, a mathematical formulation of, of this process that could be applied to sort of general problems. Now, it's interesting to note, and I'll see if I can find a reference for this next time, but I've, I've seen it, or at least read it, where Newton in his um, Principia, his, his book on optics and his gravitational book, didn't use the calculus that he had developed. So he has just tons and tons and tons of pages that are all copiously derived in Euclidean plane geometry. So he's doing all these angle side, angle side terms, etc. So he did not actually use the calculus that he had just developed to, to probably make the book like from a huge hardback down to a paperback. So let me see if I can get an example of that. Okay, I wasn't able to get a, a good example of, of excerpts from either Newton's optics or his Principia principles of mathematics and mathematical reasoning, but Newton did not actually use his calculus himself, I think partly because it was so revolutionary and so new and just a few people in the world understood it, people like Leibniz, that it, was, it would be accessible to the readers and would just generate lots of controversy, which I think at that time he was not uh, uh, encouraging. But again, as we know, are just a fundamental process. We don't even think of modern mathematics without the concept of a limit. But again, limits, the whole process and mechanism of limits are relatively new in the intellectual history of mathematics. So next lecture, we'll actually do part two. And what that will include are lots of examples of geometrical limits. Uh, limits involving derivatives, limits involving areas, limits involving integrals, limits involving functions, uh, continuity, et cetera. So we'll see types of limits. I'll go through a rehash of, of stuff you already know in terms of the epsilon delta proof, elementary proofs of limits. And then we're going to go to apply them. And then our next homework assignment after uh, this will be essentially to compute a number of limits according to the epsilon delta definition. So homework number three, uh, which I just posted yesterday, it comes right out of chapter eight in Boas and Geller, and it's the first five exercises on the axiomatic system plus problems H2 and H3 on page 78. Okay, so those are due uh, a week from today. And then there was the second problem, which is to take this Java applet, which I'll remind you again what it is, and then just turn this into symbols. In other words, calculate the areas of the triangle, put in the justification for the various manipulations that go on, similar to what we drew in, on a slide in the last lecture. And then take this and essentially make a sequence uh, rigorous mathematical steps here. Okay, so let's draw a little bit bigger one. So again, yes, not so much triangles, but this Euclid's original proof. So the fact is that you can deform, you have to justify why you can deform a triangle that way, why you can rotate it based on, you know, parallel intersecting lines, and you know, basically, it'll be a little bit of geometrical construction, some algebraic area type arguments, and then putting it together. And just turn this picture step by step. So in other words, each activity in this applet is rigorously justified by mathematics. And then 
you just have to put it all together. And this, essentially, up to this point, is the proof, rigorous proof of the Pythagorean theorem. So again, just follow what I'm. What I'm. The, the point of this is I want you to be able to look at a visual argument to say, gee, that looks right, and we know that it's not a proof unless you can write down step by step in a way that's logical and, and completely rigorous. But just turn this geometrical idea into a sequence of algebraic steps. But again, involving areas of triangles, rotations, intersecting lines, and not similar triangles. So don't go out and find a proof of Pythagorean theorem based on similar triangles, because that's not really what's going on here. OK. So that was the problem 2A. 3 is out of Geller. And homework number 4, which will be due a week after that, will have to do with the concept of limits. So I'll give you just a whole bunch of, a bunch of limits, like area limits, function limits, sequence limits, all these kind of limits. And then we'll ask you to compute the limits or find the limits and then justify them using the modern mechanisms of epsilons and deltas. Uh, OK, so I think that would be it for today. This is part one.